Hi. Now, most companies like to claim that they design around the user's needs. It seems obvious, right? The problem is, very often, they don't. Does anyone remember Sony's TV remote control for the Google TV? It had like a hundred buttons on. It was impossible to use. Well, how about the Nokia N-Gage? A mobile phone and games console all in one. Sounds great, but the speaker and microphone were on the side, so that meant you had to make a phone call and it looked like you were holding a book up to your ear. Didn't work at all. Well, our next speaker has spent a decade developing his own methodology to create real user-oriented products. He is Vyacheslav Kovalevsky. He's Senior Engineering Manager at Facebook. Or do we say Meta? I think we'll stick at Facebook, right? <laughs> and uh, he's here with us today, so welcome. Thank you, thank you. And you actually right. It's it's now Meta. Meta. Yes. <laughs> Are you all set? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm ready to go. It's uh, four a.m. in the morning on my side, but I have my enough goodness. coffee to keep me going. You have your coffee. You keep yourself refueled. Well, you look great. Uh, here we're we're getting ready for lunch here, so we're getting nervous. So. It's a, it's a tough time for everyone. Okay, okay, so I will try to, to stick to my schedule. Um, okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Vacheslav, uh, short name Slava. So, full disclosure, I'm not officially speaking on behalf of my employer, and I came here to uh, present a framework, a technique that I've been uh, using for roughly 10 years now, where I have summarized all the learning that I got from building uh, four uh, big orgs. And when I'm, what I mean by building four big organizations, I mean a group of teams that at least have three teams with uh, at least several hundred uh, cross-functional folks. Now, the talk will be summarizing the patterns for different reasons. I obviously cannot be very, very specific in examples, but I have put together a generalization that definitely will help. So for whom this talk? Uh, first of all, uh, engineers who would like to go faster in your company and understand business better. Uh, for eng managers who would love to improve collaboration with your products, for eng managers who do not have a PM and they have to effectively work as a PM and define the vision, define the strategy for the product, uh, who eng managers who just want to lead the product, not just execute what product tell them to execute. Uh, TLs who neither have an manager or they don't have a PM and they have to assume that role for quite some time. And finally, anyone who wants to build and lead the product and be successful with that. Let me start with a problem statement. And by the way, if you will get one thing from this talk today, always start with a problem. This is probably one main thing, if, if anything else, you should remember at least that part. So in order to define the problem that user-oriented development process is solving, uh, very, very quick prerequisite. Let me show you this chart. This chart is uh, quite interesting uh, and visualizes one of the problems in the industry that you need to tackle even before you aiming to create a successful product. Now, axis here, uh, x-axis here is time-wise, y-axis is something you're measuring with your product. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what. And, uh, uh, oh, I, uh, yes, it's uh, y-axis uh, is something that you're measuring. It's, uh, again, doesn't matter what. I apologize, but does my slide moving? It doesn't look like my slide is changing. Can someone confirm that it's actually changing? Yes. Okay. Now I can, now I can see it. Apologies. Apologies for that. Okay. So the why is something that you're measuring. It doesn't matter, matter, matter what exactly uh, that. The green one is uh, obvious success. If you actually have this uh, exponential growth curve, and um, your product is showing that results, obviously your product is successful. Now the red one is obvious, the end. You need to close it, whatever you were building, clearly it's not working out. Now the biggest problem in the industry right now is this zombie mode. When you kind of have some usage, but since you never have defined what success looks like for you, should you keep going? 
And to be honest, I've been a long time in the industry to be in a numerous amount of meetings where the product uh, or PM or even CEO opens up the chart that shows, oh, for my feature or my product, we have X amount of users. In such meeting, I'm always resisting to, to, to ask, but how much have you expected? Is this is more than you expected or less? How much have you expected to call a successful launch or successful usage? And without that number, without that number, any number is meaningless. You can call up front uh, it as huge success or a huge failure because you don't have a reference point to compare with. So I assume for this talk that you, when you're building anything, actually have a good understanding of this particular, particular part of the chart. As a leader, you have one specific job to define metrics and the expectation. One particular metrics that's uh, that important for the business, that's important for the org, and specifically outline greenfield, which means that product is successful. And blue field here, which means that we will discuss if we want to do proceed with this or maybe we need to pivot. Uh, and to, to be fair, as I like to say, anyone whom I support, defining this chart is one of my P0's goals. And in fact, uh, how I as a manager who support the group should be measured uh, by growing income of the folks that working uh, that working in my org because if uh, i define this chart correctly this means that uh, they working on the things that important for the business and if their income is not growing that means that either i messed up i haven't defined this chart right and it's actually not that important for the business or the work doesn't recognize the input from the folks both of them need to be need to be fixed now now we're ready to uh, outline the problem that user-oriented development process actually aim to solve. You have this chart in place, the problem statement. When we are building products, services, features, we're often not connecting to the success of our customer success. That's a problem statement many of the folks might think, no, when we build our product, we actually do connect our success with customer success. But in reality, that's not the case. And this is what UGP is trying to solve. I will talk later why people think that they're doing it uh, and why it's not actually true and how to make it true. So this is a problem. Now let's move to UGP and let's discuss how to solve it. User-oriented development process is a technique that consists different, different steps. And the simplest way to outline it is to actually take an example and walk you through a very, very uh, particular example, how you're developing product with all the stages that the UDP has. Now, I will be talking about task tracker. Let's take an example at task tracker. As I mentioned in the beginning, user-oriented development process always starts with a problem. So in the moment, we will start outlining what problem we're going to solve. But for the sake of the story, I want you to outline what we will end up building. So let's imagine that we are in the universe where there is no task tracker and we are building the business that need to build a task tracking system for our customers. Um, now, let's do it UDP way and show how exactly it should be done according to the framework that um, I'm talking about. First step, identify the main problem that you want to solve and the metrics, how you're going to measure the success. Now, let me briefly pause here and I want to define main problem. Uh, main problem is a problem that customers want to be solved now and it doesn't have any problem that need to be solved earlier. Uh, let me give you an example. Imagine that uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, I can increase ratio of pet project that you're developing that will reach the production. There is an open statistic that says that eight out of 10 pet project that any of us are doing at home never reach uh, the light of the day and never reaches the production. That's the problem. And imagine for a second, I have a solution for that problem. Uh, and it will cost you $5 per month. Uh, let's put aside right now whether you believe that the solution works or not. Let's assume I do have it. Uh, 
Would you be willing to spend that $5 per month knowing that, yes, instead of the uh, eight failed projects per, 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 per pet projects per quarter, for example, I can reduce it to two. So eight out of 10 pet projects that you have will reach the production. You actually will deliver them. Uh, now, if you... If you're ready to spend money on this particular solution to solve this particular problem, that's the main problem for you. You might have many other problems, problem at work, problem for your customers, for your business. But if you're ready to invest in this specific one, is the main one. You don't have any other blockers. Now, in our concurrent universe where no one have ever created a task tracker, the problem uh, would be like this. 60% of the software project are delivered with 60% time delays and usually 400 over budget. That's actually more or less real problem that exists in the market before the market starts uh, uh, developing different technique of developing software. Uh, here's another problem. 80% uh, of the project, personal projects, could not be delivering, uh, de delivered and released. Uh, only two out of 10 pet projects ever got released. So this is a starting point. We have defined the problems. Now, I want to mention that we probably we will progress in this talk towards the enterprise focus uh, due to several reasons. One, uh, it allows me to showcase a clear difference between user and customer. Uh, second one, uh, enterprise markets uh, quite often have uh, much, much more money. Uh, the third one, the same technique can be applied for a non-enterprise market, but in slightly similar way, you can combine several of the steps. So it's slightly more interesting to, to dive in the enterprise first. So we establish a clear problem. That's the problem that we want to solve. And we now need to establish connection with the customer. Uh, and for that, we need to figure out for each particular industry we, need, we want to solve this problem for. Uh, if you don't know the industry, that's fine. Just pick the broadest possible category. For our example, let's assume we're taking self-driving car industries. And within that industry, let's assume that uh, we have found uh, two specific customers to whom we can talk to and confirm that they do have this problem that we want to solve for them. This is usually the first point where um, people who are doing more canonical development are starting pushing back and saying, wait, we, we don't yet have a, pro have a product. And you're already asking me to build a direct relationship with, uh, um, with external customers. And the answer is yes. And think about uh, this the following way. If you cannot establish direct communication with the customer at this point and actually uh, get customer excited about the problem that you're willing to be solving, why you think that you will be able to establish a relationship with the customer when you have a prototype? Uh, in fact, not many things will change. Prototype usually is not something that the customer can, can, can start using right away. Uh, so the interest level will not be higher. Uh, therefore, a lot, of the, a lot of the products or a lot of the teams or companies uh, using these things that they don't have a, proto a prototype as procrastination technique. Uh, just to wait later that no one wants exactly this solution or no one actually has this problem uh, later on when, when so much money and time spent. Uh, the trick here to find several customers within the industries that can be more or less representative of the whole industry. You don't have to aim in, uh, for this engagement for two biggest one, but someone who represented industry as a whole, and the same time would be willing to have a deep engagement with you. Let's assume you found the found the fox and it's on you how, but again, let's assume now you have a deep engagement. Second step uh, to identify restriction under which you working. Uh, this restriction usually imposed by government or by CEO or by someone who in this particular industry and in this particular company can decide uh, which standards you have to comply in order for the company to even look on your product. For example, it could be GDPR. 
And if we do solving a problem, problem of task tracking, we very likely will have uh, to store data that uh, uh, qualified under the, the data that GDPR governs or, or HIPAA that actually uh, have several requirements for any software that um, uh, process or store medical information or other things. Now, this is a very important point that often overlook, uh, overlooked. The key here that you don't have to build solution to the problem that better than any solution on the market right now. What you actually have to build is a solution that better than any other product that passing uh, these requirements. This is very important part because usually when uh, when people start doing uh, start doing their products, they looking on um, uh, they looking on. Uh, uh, all the competitors in the market and trying to compete with them, which is which is which is wrong. Uh, if the customers need to ha uh, have to have uh, GDPR approved products, uh, you just need to be better than any service that also supports GDPR, and that's usually a much smaller subset of the products. Now. Uh, one of the last but not the least before actually talking with the user who's going to click your button uh, is integrators. This is a team within the customer that will be in charge of taking your product and onboarding the whole company on your product. They will ultimately decide uh, whether your product comply with the restriction that they have inside of the company. Uh, imagine that you have a product that reduces project budget of run from 400% to 300% uh, that we just mentioned. That's the key problem for them. However, even though it's reduction, it's improvement, it will take three years and five million to onboard. Now, suddenly, this team might start thinking and actually calculating if reduc reduction of budget of around from 400% to 300% is actually worth it because now they have to invest years of years of work and on top of that spend 5 million. Now, they can uh, enforce things like, for example, Active Directory. Let's assume that the company using Active Directory for the sake of uh, authentication. Now, if you never talk to this team and you delivered your product, you might not have this ability. You might not need. You might need to redesign this completely from ground up, even to be able to integrate with Active Directory's authentication for your for your products. When you have established this direct communication, you found all these restrictions. Only now you actually would be focusing on talking to the users that will be actually clicking buttons within your product and figuring out the minimum viable solution for the users that satisfy all the requirements that we just have discussed. Now, this is a very important point. And I'm pretty sure that everyone, if you ever have worked in any big companies, you know this, this situation when you're looking at the tool it doesn't matter. I'm pretty sure there is a tool like that in any companies. And you're thinking, whoa, this tool is horrible. I know so many tools that are better, uh, that are right now on the market. Why? Why are we using this? Why are we using this task tracker? Why are we using this system for uh, vacation tracking or whatever? This specific chart explained that because you are the user, but you're not the customer. The customers who actually gave a green light might have a very specific requirements for the security of the tool uh, that uh, can be used within that particular enterprise that you are part of. Now, after going through all this process, and keep in mind, we're trying to solve the problem of budget overruns and planning. The next step is to find the simplest possible solution that solve that problem. And this is a key part that also quite often uh, overseen, and I will sp speak later uh, in more details why. Uh, in our example, we can actually use Google Workspace, Google Docs with Google Cloud uh, platform that has ability to implement identification through the Active Directory. Now, together, it's finally give you a platform where that you can use that is HIPAA compliant, that is GDPR compliant to track tasks. You can actually use a spreadsheet within Google Workspace where you can use uh, put a task, where you can put assignee, uh, and it actually will qualifies for everything that, that is needed. Uh, 
Um, now I want to mention one thing. In almost any groups that I ever have built, we established the interesting pattern of reviewing designs because this is a part where you're designing the solution with, with your group. And in many, many cases, uh, in the classical canonical development, design doc will include discussion of the technical solution, whether this particular long-term solution will solve or will deliver required user experience. Now, I usually proposing to, uh, to have a design doc that specifically focused on these four aspects. Is the, the clear problem statement when uh, engineering group actually designing something? I want to learn if they do understand very clearly what the problem that they're solving. Prove that the problem is the main problem. Uh, solution. And finally, prove that proposed solution is the simplest one. It's quite uh, unusual to see a product on the market that got failed because they choose the wrong database. But it's quite often that the product have failed because they choose their own problem. And yet, on majority of the reviews, we're reviewing solution. We're reviewing all the time on the market. Are we choosing the right database? Are we choosing the right uh, system for uh, sending the messages be between front and back end or different components of the system? Instead of reviewing, uh, are we solving the main problem or are we solving the main problem in the simplest possible way? Now, as soon as this uh, simplest possible, uh, possible way established, and in our particular example, it turns out we don't even have to build anything. We can use a workspace, we can uh, uh, use a GCP uh, service that integrates the Active Directory. Now we can onboard user. As you can see, there is no even quote unquote development phase here. I always saying onboard user because again, in the processes that I uh, bootstrapping, I usually connecting uh, directly developers who are developing uh, solutions directly with the customers and hold them accountable to solve particular problem for particular customer. And if you have to build a service for that to solve the problem, so be it, we will build the service. But time to time, we might need to update docs or we might need to build just a solution per se. Time to time, we just need to build a feature. And now after that, you start cycling and repeating that. Uh, after the first onboarding, customer in our, uh, in our world can come to you and say, okay, how we can assign the task for the user? Uh, and we'll loop it again. Uh, next question may be where I can see all my tasks. And indeed, Google Docs doesn't have uh, the, the one page where you can go and see all the tasks that assigned to you. And at some point, you will figure out that you're building completely custom UI, you're using Google Docs as a backend. And at some point, you will realize that you no longer need to use Google Docs in the backend. In fact, this is a, a wrong backend. If you now have your own site, you're redesigning backend from scratch, and you end up with something that looks like this. Uh, now, with this example, uh, usually when uh, I'm presenting it to folks that never work with me, never see the success of user-oriented development process, don't know the, the background, there are two reactions, either push back or start using it in the wrong way. And I want to address both of them. First, why people think this is a bad idea to do things with this framework. Now imagine a space of features that you can build. You have uh, this, this, this black screen right now is a space of features. You have a starting point, which is nothing. You have V1, which is a product that you can actually scale and sell on the market. Uh, in our example uh, of moving to Google Doc first, we actually moved away, completely away from that product that we end up building. We moved to Google Docs, we build it, then we build some task page that shows you all the tasks that you have. And at some point we actually arrived to be one. And when majority of the people look at this, uh, the, first, the first question, okay, why not to do this? We have tons of the tons of the wasted work. We 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 we're not going to use many of the things that we build. We will have to drop tons of them. So why not to design everything properly and directly go to V1 as fast as we can? This is the most common question that uh, you you might be hearing a lot. You also will try to start practicing UODP. However, if you will recall, and if you're actually honest with yourself, and when you delivered your successful product, and you will, will go back and start thinking, 
where you wanted to go, you will realize that you would want you wanted to go somewhere like that. Your idea where we want should be was completely in different place. And after delivering it, you would have to go back because suddenly you have learned that your customers absolutely need Active Directory sign-in. And without that, they cannot use it. But there was a design choices that prevent you to integrate with Active Directory uh, sign-in. So now you have to redesign tons of the things and go back. So, of course, people who ever been through this process with budget overruns, with many overruns, with uh, uh, processes when you kind of delivering Q1 and then spending a year or two fixing it to make sure that it's actually usable, that it's actually successful product. Obviously, when they see this picture, they will try to tell, no, 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 no. We have tons of this best practices that specifically prevent you from, from doing this uh, wrong, wrong pattern of development. You should go directly, directly to V1. Let's design everything correctly. Um, and so on, so on, so on. There will be tons of the gatekeepers that will uh, specifically emphasize that. So this is the first one and the reason, and the reason why, why people react to this this way, because this schema is optimizing learning. Even if you have some magical way of knowing where V1 is, so let's assume that you actually know precisely where V1 is, so you don't have this problem of going to the wrong direction, uh, as I showed in the previous slide. Even in this case, there is a time difference between you starting development and you actually reaching V1. And this means that the problem that, that uh, exists on the market might not exist by the time you're delivering it. So even if you know where V1 is, you still need to go the route that allows you to have faster first delivery to your customers and start onboarding it. Now, the second thing that I'm hearing quite often, isn't this an over-optimization one, one particular customer? Are we taking and building something for just one customer that will be hard to generalize? Now, let's take, a, again, the example of features. So let's assume this is a space of the features that we can implement, and this white circle is the set of the features that particular customer need in order to start using your solution to the problem. Now, let's take second customer. That's the second customer, and again, set of features that you need in order, the customer needs in order to start using your solution, obviously, sort of. If you have an amazing department that investigating the market, very likely they can give you this. However, what will, uh, I don't want to say fail you, but is this, is the fact that uh, each of the customers has these small nuanced requirements that while they are infrequent, they are blockers for each of the customer to use it. So again, Active Directory. Uh, what if only 10% of the market need that Active Directory? Yeah, you can probably can say just 10%, 30%. Let's move it to V2. Let's, let's do it later. The same might be for requirements of supporting, uh, supporting GDPR. Not uh, because it's geographically location related, we can move it to V2. And in the end, you're delivering product that covers 80% of the requirements, but none of the customer can use it. What I found in the past, and this rule of thumb work for the decade, and I'm sure will work for the next decade as well. It's much simpler to build the product around one customer and end up having generalized solution than to try to build generalized solution that actually can be used by at least one customer on day zero. The second one is less likely, nevertheless, everyone trying to do so. I, I, I'm still not sure why. Now, the second question is, how about the long-term projects? Oh, looks like what you're proposing, Slava, is about taking small hacks, putting them together, releasing, taking small hacks, and, 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 and repeat. Now, in reality, uh, this is not exactly the case. Let's take a timeline, and let's see, say that you're building three services for, again, solving three problems. Uh, in reality, when you have a timeline, you're building project one, project two, project three, uh, you might find yourself that if you messed up at least one of the project, it takes more time and you have finite amount of the, of the development team. So yeah, you're still waiting to start project two. UDP is about fixing this timeline and making it look more like this, where you solve problem number one with just updating doc. You found the hack 
Then you found the hack for problem number two, and you finally arrive at the problem that requires actually building a services. So if you do need to build a service, you're building them. This is a common misunderstanding. Problem doesn't mean uh, the simplest possible way to solve the problem doesn't mean that the simplest way uh, is uh, always a day or week or quarter. It actually might be multi-year effort and that would be a simplest possible way to solve the problem. In order to illustrate that, I do need to provide the uh, hierarchy of the problems. And I will do it quick because I uh, quickly running out of time. On the lowest level, you have a problem that customer facing with your product, something like, oh, I don't like the color of the background. Now there is a middle level of the problem is a problem that customer solving with your product. Why are they even choosing your product? And finally, what I like to say is a problem behind the problem uh, is uh, in our in our case, 80% of the of the project missing the deadline. That's what they care about. And now as a subsequent, they found that in order to fix that, they need an issue tracker. They don't have issue trackers. And you're constantly moving in between this level. You're solving the first level, the smallest level. When you run out of this problem, you're taking the main problem from the next level and so on and so on. Now, the main pitfall, as I mentioned, some of the people push back, some of the people using it in the wrong way, and only few practicing it right. So what does it mean to use UADP in the wrong way? Uh, first thing that I've seen the most, we have the amazing tool, technology solution. Now let's find the problem that this solution is, is solving. Working backwards from the solution instead of working backwards from the problem. I called it problem of geniuses. Uh, if you know about five problems the market that you need to solve and you stack rank them, you have a clarity. However, very smart people, they all um, uh, like to do so. And uh, I actually don't know, but I don't know why, but every, every really smart people in the market, they like to emphasize problem out of the context. If you take any problem out of the context, you can usually sell it uh, as a very important one because out of the context, yes, we all five problems are the key to the world. We all, and we need to solve all five of them. But again, if you're taking one out of the context, uh, in the example of the task tracker, let's say gun chart, we need a gun chart for task. And yes, this is a very important problem. You can find the customers who will tell you we need a gun chart. But again, you, you should not be solving uh, Gantt chart visualization until you have an active directory or if you have a GDPR compliance, yada, yada. But if you will take it out of the context. Now, what happens, uh, imagine that you have a, someone that, uh, that's trying to uh, push your org in towards solving this specific problem. Let's do a Gantt chart. Let's emphasize this feature. Time passes, you have another team that delivered uh, GDPR compliance. Later, they delivered uh, uh, Active Directory solution. And now finally, that team that has a proven track record of solving problem pragmatically will be the team that will solve the Gantt chart visualization. And now you have a genius uh, who actually was predicting that we need a gun chart, was telling you that we need a gun chart, but no one was listening to that person. And now you have completely another team that delivering guard chant visualization. This quite often makes people unhappy and you need to be aware of this and preempt that by describing how you are doing your prioritization. Because this might lead to a very interesting dynamic in the teams because people kind of saw that this needs to be done up front, but nevertheless, uh, they might not be the one that end up doing it um, and so on, so on. Now, the second one, I put the word user my, my goal, and therefore now it's user-oriented. You can again say that user will be able to see the dependency. We have a gun chart. It doesn't mean that it's user-oriented because as we saw, the user has completely different risk of problem statement right now. Uh, ignoring last mile integration. This is a, one of the important parts where uh, you develop the product, but you're not onboarding the customers. This is a key difference between UGP and normal execution. In normal execution, is just delivering the product according to the spec you've done. Uh, onboarding the customers include this last mile integration where well, you, uh, you will discover additional problems that you need to solve as you progress. 
finally, using different audience for uh, verifying the problem and uh, delivering solution to. It's one thing to ask um, a student uh, which problem you have when, you, when you're developing deep learning solutions. And other things to deliver it and try to sell to big enterprises. You need to have the same audience. I'm going to skip last part because I weigh uh, over time. Uh, but if I would be to give one advice how to start, revisit your uh, tasks and make them a problem list. Never have a task list, have a problem list, figure out how to solve them later, uh, connect your developers directly with the customers for whom they're solving the problem. This is very specific to any org that I ever built. Each software developer I see always connected directly with the customer and expectations for the IC solve this particular problem for this particular customer. Uh, and yes, if it requires to build a service, we will build the service. Uh, I'm going to skip recap and go directly to question transfer system. There are several, several small things, but uh, we unfortunately don't have time. So thank you. There is a link for Facebook, uh, Facebook group uh, specifically dedicated to UDP when you can read more, ask me questions. Since it's uh, 5 a.m. on my side, I apologize. I probably wouldn't be able to hang up uh, by a lot. Any questions that we might have? And to be fair, I'm not sure where to check them. Okay, Slava, thank you so much for, for your time, especially at such an uncomfortable morning hour. Um, so thanks very much for that. I would like to ask you, Slava, I guess this methodology of yours is primarily based upon your own experience and your, what you've seen with your own eyes over your career, but have you also been influenced by other people's work? And if so, who would they be? Oh, uh, of course, of course. Uh, so mostly, uh, it's a, sorry, it takes me a moment to, uh, to uh, recall the authors, uh, but I would highly suggest to, to read the books Antifragility. Uh, I would highly suggest to read the book, uh, who, oh, effectively the same author about, uh, oh, uh, of, and of course, Black Swan. Uh, I forgot, I forgot the author. I really horrible with the names, but, uh, that idea of, uh, uh, the fact that events with uh, low likelihood has disproportional impact on our life was the key idea here, because the whole idea to prioritize learning and move as fast as you can, because the longer time between you start and you delivering the more chances that there will be a black swan that completely ruined your plan. Doesn't matter how good the plan is. And that's effectively foundation on top of which the whole uh, framework got created. How about the work of Christiansen, for example, and his jobs to be done framework? You're familiar with that? Uh, actually, actually only heard and read the, the read several articles, but no, and thank you. Thank you for pointing out. I definitely will check it, it out. It, oh. Much of what you were saying reminded me of that. In particular, his talk about his work with McDonald's when he was brought in as a consultant and um, they, they had a specific challenge for him was that they wanted to sell more milkshakes and they uh, had tried lots of things in the past, like for example, changing the flavors, changing the size, obviously changing the prices, merchandising, marketing plans, all kinds of things. Nothing had really boosted milkshake sales. And when Christiansen came in, he asked the very question that you did, start with the problem. So what, why are people actually buying milkshakes? What, what is the purpose of the milkshake? Or what is the job that the milkshake is doing is the way he defines it. And uh, there were some assumptions that of course, milkshakes are drunk by kids. Families are going in and buying milkshakes for their kids. But in fact, what he discovered is that people were often buying milkshakes in the morning as something for, that was nourishing and that they could put in the car and it wouldn't spill. And so actually the, the, the problem that the milkshake was solving was very different to the one that had been assumed. So I, I could see how that was tying in with what you were talking about anyway. Absolutely. This is uh, the, the key problem when people starting with a solution and trying to find the problem. And obviously that never works well instead of actually finally discover what the key problem, what the main problem and, uh, and start doing that. Absolutely. That reminds me also of a joke where there was a man driving uh, I think he wanted to get to the airport and he stops and asks for directions and the person gives him directions by saying, well, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs>
That's, that's yes, what came to my mind as you were showing this very nice uh, chart with the start leading up to the V1. So, um, Slava, thank you so much for your time. We are actually getting very nervous ourselves because we are overrunning by 10 minutes and we have lunch. We have very hungry stomachs here in Spain. Lunch is absolutely sacred. So people are getting very stressed here. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for, for this uh, wonderful talk and for your insights. And to the rest Thank of you. us.